Welcome to the NWA ETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood for the talk today. Thanks, Kent. We're going to do a two-week series on interpreting resistance tests and a little more detail into some of the important mutations. Today I'm going to focus on NRTI resistance, which is a topic that comes up frequently in our clinic and in our ECHO cases. I'm really going to focus on these first three mutations, the 184V, the K65R, TAMs, which we've talked about here and there on ECHO, and I'll just mention these others, L74V, the Q151 mutation complex, and the T69 insertion complex. I'm going to be referring a lot to the Stanford database. I'm sure many of you have used this. If you haven't, it's a really, really powerful and useful tool. Here's the website, and generally what you do when you go here is you then click this HIV database program, and what that brings you to is this screen where you can either type in the string of mutations that you've got on your patient, or you can use a pull-down menu. For example, here I've put in M184V, or the other option would be to just go to the pull-down under 184 and put V. And I'd recommend if you're trying to get better at interpreting resistance tests, just play with this and put different mutations in there. And what it gives you is a genotype-like interpretation of susceptibility and resistance, some comments which can be really useful about the mutations, and then this scoring system at the bottom. And I'm going to show a lot of these today because it really helps learn how to interpret these mutations. So this is called a mutation score or a penalty score, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. So let's talk about a typical case. So a 50-year-old HIV-infected woman presents to clinic for follow-up. She has struggled with adherence to tenofovir amtricitabine, which is Truvada, and to nevirapine, or viramune, and her HIV RNA or viral load has increased to 2,450 copies, and you do a resistance assay, and one of the mutations is an M184V. So what does that M184V mean? So this is a substitution mutation, meaning at codon 184, there's been an amino acid substitution, here methionine for valine, and that substitution does some really, really fascinating things. So first, it causes high-level resistance to m which is FTC, and lamivudine, which is 3TC, low-level resistance to abacavir, which isn't that clinically significant, which is why sometimes we add a bacavir and it does retain a lot of activity in the setting of a 184V, and low-level resistance to DDI. It also increases susceptibility to tenofovir, AZT, and D4T, and it actually delays the appearance of TAM mutations. We'll talk more about TAMs in a second. So the 184V really protects these three mutations. And then the other thing it does, which sometimes we can make use of, is it reduces viral fitness. So what if we put M184V or I into the Stanford database? This is the table of mutation score I've recreated here that you would see. And I think this is really useful to look at. So these mutation scores or penalty scores tell you how resistant the virus is to each drug, with a higher number being more resistance. So Above, 60 or above is high level resistance, 30 to 60 intermediate, 10 to 30 low level, and less than zero is actually hyper susceptible. So if we look here, 60 indicates high level resistance to 3TC and FTC. We've got low level resistance here to Abacavir and DDI. And then if we look at AZT, D4T, and Tenofovir, we've actually got negative numbers, meaning hyper susceptibility. So this is what the Stanford database would tell you about the M184V. If we look at a typical genotype that has a 184V, here's our NRTI mutation, a 184V. And on the genotype, what it's going to tell you is resistance to 3TC and FTC, because that's really all the genotype is doing, is interpret interpreting resistant or not. So a genotype is not going to tell you about all the hyper susceptibility that happens. So really, you have to induce that yourself or here's another resistance report, and this is a virtual phenotype. So here are 
the resistance mutations where they've actually sequenced the key enzymes and given you the mutations just like on a genotype. So here's our NRTI mutations, and you can see, focus on the 184V here, ignore these other two mutations. And if we look at what that does, here, because it's a virtual phenotype, they've actually put it into a database and predicted what the phenotype is. So here's your fold change like you would see on a phenotype. And this is a virtual phenotype, so these are predicted. But look at what it does. Here's the Mividino 3TC. Look how high the fold change is, and so we have minimal response. Same with FTC resistant. And then if we look at DDI and abacavir reduced response, and the three drugs that we know become hypersusceptible hyper susceptible, AZT, D4T, and tenofovir, we see a maximal response. So here's exactly what the M1A4V mutation does. So what do we do in the setting of a 1A4V? How do we treat patients? There's a lot of debate. There's really no right answer. This is a very interesting study that David Spock passed on to me, which was presented at ICAC back in 2009, but to our knowledge has never actually been published. But I think it's probably the most interesting study done on how to treat patients in the setting of a 1A4V. So it was done in British Columbia. They had 117 patients with a documented 1A4V mutation. They could also have NNRTI mutations. These patients did not have PI mutations or other NRTI mutations. And these are the second line regimens that patients were randomized to, either two NRTIs that included 3DC or FTC plus a boosted PI, or two NRTIs including 3TC or FTC and a boosted PI and at least one other active agent, or two NRTIs excluding 3TC or FTC, a boosted PI with or without another active agent. And in the end, there was no difference between groups A, B, and C. So my strategy personally is in the setting of an isolated 184V, if there's a low viral load and if I am very confident in the patient's adherence, I think they're going to be 100% adherence, then I do A, two NRTIs with 3TC or FTC and a boosted PI, even though technically that isn't three active drugs. In that setting, I think it can work. If the viral load is high, if I'm not confident the patient's going to have 100% adherence, then I will do B or C. That's my personal strategy, but there's no really strict or good guideline for how to treat patients in that setting. So let's look at another case and another mutation. So this is actually a case that was presented on ECHO and that we've talked about and I thought would be instructive. So a 33-year-old man with HIV hep C co-infection is being considered for hep C treatment <clears throat> to include a hep C PI. Current ARVs are AZT3TC, which is Combivir, plus Adazanavir, which is Reitaz, and Norvir. Viral load is undetectable, and a past resistance assay showed a K65R mutation. So let's talk about K65R. This is a signature tenofovir mutation, meaning if you were to give somebody tenofovir monotherapy, um, then the most likely mutation to develop would be K65R. Or this has been shown in the lab in in vitro studies where only tenofovir is given, K65R is the most likely mutation to present. It can also develop with abacavir or DDI, although abacavir more commonly leads to an L74V mutation more commonly than the K65R. I'm not going to talk a lot about L74V. There's some interesting um, quirks about that mutation as well, but a key point is that that's the most likely mutation with abacavir. And then the key point about the K65R is that it causes resistance to just about all of the NRTIs with the exception that it actually increases susceptibility to AZT. So in the setting of K65R that can be used to your advantage. Some other things about the K65R mutation. K65R and TAMS tend to be mutually exclusive, not always, but they don't tend to occur together. K65R and 184V together decrease viral fitness more than a 184V alone. Sometimes we can use that to our advantage. And there's a greater likelihood of developing K65R with subtype or clade C virus, which is much more common in sub-Saharan Africa. And so in developing countries, that has interesting implications for which second-line regimens uh, should be used in the setting of virologic failure. Now, if we plug a K65R into the Stanford database, this is what we see. So really, intermediate level resistance to all of the NRTIs, with the exception of AZT, which has a negative number, so hyper susceptibility. So here is the patient's 
actual genotype, you see a K65R and actually an M184V as well. And if we look at the interpretation of the genotype, we see resistance to all of the NRTIs except AZT, which makes sense because the K65R is making the AZT hypersusceptible, as is the 184V. So AZT here in this genotype is the one NRTI where the genotype is going to say no evidence of resistance, but you know because of the mutations there might actually be hyper susceptibility there. So here's another case. Let's talk about the TAMs. So a 43-year-old heavily treatment experienced woman presents to restart antiretroviral therapy after a lapse due to drug use. A past genotype demonstrated a 184V plus an M41L and T215Y. So let's talk about what those mutations do and what they mean. So these are called thymidine analog mutations. There are two paths, as you've probably heard. The first pathway tends to be the worst of the two, but patients do not always, the resistance does not always track down, for example, path one, then path two. There can be a mix, as in one of the, as in one of the cases we're going to talk about today. But these mutations emerge sequentially with use of either AZT or D4T, and the key point is that they confer some degree of resistance to all NRTIs. As I mentioned, path one in general is worse. We'll look at the penalty scores of the different mutations on the next slide. And the other important thing is as these accumulate, resistance worsens. So as the number of TAMs increases, the level of resistance increases. Interestingly, TAMs may protect against NNRTI resistance. This has been uh, borne out in a couple of lab studies. Clinically, we don't totally know what to do with this. And as we'll talk about next week, all of the NNRTI scoring systems do not take this into account. So clinically, I really don't know what to do with this, but lab studies do show that TAMs protect against, for example, etrovirine resistance. So let's look at the penalty scores for the TAMs. And let's look at first pathway to begin with, and I've put the T215Y in red here because that tends to be the worst. And what you can see here is the penalty scores for each individual mutation, and then what happens if you have all three path, uh, pathway one TAMs. And what you'll notice is that these don't all directly add up. For example, if you look at AZT resistance, 15, 15, 45, doesn't add up to 105 because individually this is the resistance they, they create, but combined there's an exponential increase in resistance. And that's why as these accumulate, you really worry about resistance worsening. The worst mutation tends to be the T215Y, especially in terms of AZT, D4T, and tenofovir resistance. And the combination of M41L and T215Y is also especially bad and very common with TAMs. If we look at the second pathway, resistance you'll notice overall is not as great. If you have a patient who has, for example, all six, pathway one and pathway two, then these add up to even higher penalty scores. This is also a key point. This is from a paper from Joel Gallant from 2005, which is an excellent review of resistance. And this is a figure that Paul Sachs often shows in his resistance uh, talks as well. So the key point here is that with development of NRTI resistance, the 184 generally occurs first. And this is why David Spock describes the 184V as a sign that the dam is breaking. So for example, with Combivir or Trisivir, you often get a 184V followed by TAMs. Um, with Epsicom, you often get 184V followed by, as we talked about, L74V or K65R. And with Truvada, it would often be a 184V followed by a K65R. This is also why if we find these mutations on a resistance report, we often just induce that there was probably a 184V in the background, even if we haven't caught it on our resistance test. So the key point here is that M184V is really a sign of bad resistance developing, and we need to, if at the earliest signs, we need to stop uh, or switch ARVs so that uh, we prevent further resistance from developing. Briefly, for those of you who are getting a little more advanced inter interpreting resistance reports, I'll just mention these. So the Q151 mutation complex and T69 insertion complex are both uh, resistance patterns that create resistance to basically all of the NRTIs. With the Q151 mutation complex, tenofovir tends to be the least resistant and tends to retain the most activity. Uh, with the T69 insertion complex, you basically create resistance to all of the NRTIs. And I'll show you 
Here is an example, and this is what we're really trying to prevent. So this is an actual patient's phenotype. This is a patient I saw during fellowship. And if we look at the NRTI resistance here, what you see, interestingly, so you've got a 184V, you've got a TAM here, and then this Q151M with the 62V, 75I, 77L, and 116Y. So that's a Q151 mutation complex. And what this creates is resistance to all of the NRTIs, but because of the Q151 mutation complex, tenofovir retains the most susceptibility, and with the 184V, increasing susceptibility to tenofovir. That's why tenofovir is the one mutation here that probably retains some activity in terms of the NRTIs. So just to summarize, 184V creates resistance to 3TC and FTC, increases susceptibility to tenofovir, AZT, and D4T, and reduces viral fitness. 65R causes resistance to most NRTIs, but actually increases susceptibility to AZT. TAMs cause resistance to AZT and D4T, and also have some cross-resistance with tenofovir, especially in the first pathway, and as things accumulate with the TAMs, they get worse. L74V is the most common abacavir-associated mutation, and the Q151 mutation complex and T69 insertion complex cause near class-wide NRTI resistance.